Okay. Yeah. So thank you, everyone. And welcome to the Open Life Science uh, Leadership Workshop that we will be running. So as a reminder, the, the Carpentries has a code of conduct. There is a link in line 35 of the HackMD where you can actually read about the code of conduct. And please do spend a moment or two looking at that if you haven't before. And um, as a general rule, that is basically asking us to all respect one another and treat one another the way we might wish to be treated. And if at any point you witness or experience unacceptable behavior, the Carpentries Code of Conduct Committee email is coc at carpentries.org. Um, hopefully there won't be any need to worry about that. Uh, so we also have an icebreaker question in the HackMD document today. So if you can meet a fictional heroic character from a book or a TV show, please add that in. Just add your name and um, add the character. Well, Vika has uh, started this off with Totoro. Uh, <laughs> so I'm just imagining some really amazing, beautiful trees and forests at the moment. That sounds great. But everyone else, feel free to just fill those in while we're working on this. Um, so we are going to start with a quick introduction to uh, what open life science is and sort of talk a little bit about what open leadership is and some of the skills that you may wish in open science but in open research as well more broadly um so Marvika, do you want to do this one or shall i you can you can carry on with that sure okay i'm just going to try sharing my screen let's see how this goes share screen and I think I'm going to have to reconnect. This is a new computer and I cannot see the screen properly. It's so, okay. I'll, I'll start with the first one. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. So um, the slides are linked, but you don't need to look at it. You can definitely share it. Uh, that's why the link has been provided. I'm going to make sure that I see some of the faces. So Open Life Science is a project which we have designed uh, with the empowerment of communities with open principle in mind. Why we called our session as building a leadership mindset by mentoring is because this is a mentoring and training program that runs over 16 week uh, of training. So it's been a uh, designed by three of us, Berenice, Yo, and me. Uh, and we launched it last year. We have run the first cohort with 20 projects, which we will talk a little bit more about. And now we are in the process where we are trying to reach out to wider community in order to recruit as many uh, project leaders as possible, especially keeping in mind that there are communities where access to training and mentorship could really make a huge difference. So we believe that science can advance only and only when every researcher shares their work with each other and not claims the ownership on the knowledge. Therefore, we uh, keep different communities of open science in mind. Uh, we know that there are people who are building uh, their communities around the fact that they are storing data as a service, uh, calling it open data, developing open source code, open source software, they're designing hardware, uh, sharing methods and protocol, making it openly accessible, communicating results early on in the preprints, reviewing papers, transferring skills by training, collaborating with public, supporting and connecting others in your community and welcoming contributors and mentors in terms of community building. So all these words, uh, I have italicized because I want to draw your attention on the action-oriented practice. These do not happen automatically or by default. This is where you need to keep your intention and thoughts into mind. So in a study of 2012, uh, which involved 160 tech companies, uh, it was found that the level of strategic intent in openness and not openness alone correlates with effective market performance. And that's a little bit techy example. We also included an academic example from OpenR, uh, which talks about cultural change towards open science, requires leadership, vision, and strategy, as in the study that I uh, discussed earlier, and targeted measures. There needs to be transparency and accountability, and there has to be trust and confidence in a shared vision. 
And when we think about all these, these are the skills that are not traditionally taught in the university. It's expected that you would, that you would learn because you're a scientist and that generally doesn't happen. This is where we need to actually train our researchers to be thoughtful about their own leadership, empower them with the fact that they all can actually lead the project that they are designing and create a shared vision so they involve others from their communities. So as I said, these are highly uh, important leadership skills which are useful and transferable but not formally taught in academia. So I would explain OLS journey in nutshell. Uh, we have two sets of community members. We have project leads and mentees who I will refer as Joy, and we have mentors and experts who I will refer as Sam. So we have a story circle for them. Let's think about Joy, who's a scientist. Joy wants to become an open science practitioner. They join OLS, which is Open Life Science, with a project to develop. They receive training and mentorship, they gain confidence and open leadership skills. They apply those skills in their own work while being trained and they build confidence to finally work openly. At the end, what they learn is not really restricted to the project they're developing, but also the practices that they take into their work from there on. So project leads in short receive training through cohort calls. They get introduced to new topics and they have chance to discuss these ideas with each other. And then they develop their idea through guided practice and mentorship call. So who are these mentors? Here is a story circle for our mentor, Sam. Sam is an open science practitioner. They understand the gaps that exist in open science and in skills. They join OLS uh, to share their knowledge with people like Joy. They receive mentoring support. They provide guidance to their mentees, given what the objective of their mentees are. They offer their time and expertise. This is not a supervision-based mentorship. This is a mentorship where these mentees are holding accountable space. And then they shared insight and build meaningful connection, not just with mentees, but other mentors and experts in the program. Um, at the end, they also advance their skills in mentoring and consulting. So to summarize, mentors work closely with mentees throughout the cohort to guide their pro process. And there are experts who provide insights through uh, calls, uh, talks in cohort calls, and they also get invited to uh, get consulting in different projects. So 16 week long uh, mentoring program where we have one week cohort based training. Uh, then we, we also have hands on practice, which is based on the assignments that we provide them. And in the next week, they would meet their mentors. So we have this rhythm of one week of cohort call, one week of mentor based uh, hands on practice. So we have, uh, we are in the process of starting our second uh, cohort uh, in September. We have so far uh, 54 experts and several mentors, and we also have in approximately 50 participants. We have 31 projects at the moment, um, and we are also offering mentorship and collaboration uh, in collaboration with the institute. So, for example, the Turing Way is a project that's my day job, and uh, from that, we have also established a formal connection. And we're at the moment applying for fundings to sustain our program. So at the end, what I would wanna say that what we teach our students, we say that we explore together different concepts one step at a time, because we, do, we believe that not everybody can be expert in all these knowledge, and therefore we need to combine our knowledge and invite each other to work together. Um, to finish this part, uh, I would like to acknowledge everybody from OLS1. We should update this slide for sure because we have uh, at the moment up to 100 community members who have come forward to support other people in uh, this program. So that's my talk. So with that, I will ask you to please go back to HackMD. Uh, there's a space for you to take shared notes. Uh, it's for you, but also people who cannot attend this session and might find it interesting. Um, and with that, I'll give it to you to talk about who are open leaders and what open leadership actually means.
Amazing. I think that I've got my screen sharing working now. So fingers crossed, this will all be good. Um, I'll just reiterate though, if there's any questions, like whilst we are talking, um, then feel free to just add notes uh, in the shared notes section as well. And then we can pick those up when you get there. Um, so I'm going to start screen sharing and hopefully this time it will in fact do what I was trying. Yes, this looks so much better. Okay, right, clicking share. Right, can you see my screen? Yep, I've got nods. Fantastic. Okay, right. So talking about what open leadership is. Um, so in this case, jump down. There we go. Okay, so we've Malvika has already introduced the Open Life Science program, and uh, this this time we're going to talk specifically about the fact that we are trying to teach people, whether they're new to science or whether um, whether they're actually experienced with open science already, but to become leaders and ambassadors for open science. Um, and so this is a sentence that we use a lot that's from the open leadership framework which was created by Mozilla um, and in this case we're talking about the fact that we empower people to collaborate within inclusive communities so that means people from any sort of background any sort of experience different looks and cultures sexuality anything like that we want to make sure that the communities make everyone feel valued we believe that that's an important part of your leadership when you are leading openly to have a genuinely balanced uh, community um, so people who are participating in open life science, they lead their projects openly, they share their work effectively and they try and actually bring around culture change. So it's not just about managing your own project and what you're doing with a specific aim, but more, looking more broadly at the systemic issues um, and ways to make communities more open all around you um, where possible. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll run through some of the topics that are um, that we cover in open life science. We have links to each of the different week uh, different weeks where we cover these topics. Uh, but these are things I think we consider broadly really important as part of open science and open research skills that need to be um, addressed or at least we need to think be thinking about a little bit. Um, so. Just to give you an idea, uh, I think Malvika mentioned briefly again earlier that one week we tend to speak with your mentor one on one and the other week is a full cohort call. So I'll be covering the details that are actually within each of these cohort calls. Um, so the first week that we have, which is actually week two, because uh, your first week is always going to be a mentor meeting. So week two, aka the first cohort call is where we actually just start thinking about the project. So if you've come along and you're thinking about um, how to apply open skills to a project that you may have, the first step is actually going to be thinking what the project is and what your goals are. And that's why you spend a little time reflecting on the current and desired community interactions that you may have. Um, and we use a tool called Open Canvas to actually just sort of diagram out some of the ways that you want to engage different people. And I always find when I look at the open canvas, you think, well, this is a, like just a bit of a form filling exercise, but actually what it does is it really helps you think critically about who you're trying to engage and how you're trying to engage them. So it's a really valuable exercise. And we also think about the value exchanges that you can offer. So um, when you have a community and an open community, very often people may be volunteers, um, but that doesn't mean that you cannot provide value for them in some way, as well as them providing value for you. Moving on to the next call that we have, week four, we start talking about building a welcoming space. So previously you've been thinking about the what do I want to do? Now you think, how do I actually bring people in? How do I make it, you know, put out a, a doormat that says welcome? And so you, you um, create a roadmap so that people can see where you're going. A code of conduct can help you think about um, managing issues and hopefully preventing issues, interpersonal issues that may happen. Uh, within your within your project area within your community talking about contribution guidelines so people know how to contribute because too often there are unwritten norms uh, and it's really important to expose these types of things so that people actually know how to contribute without being afraid to ask and then we start talking about uh, some open science methods so um, those can be things like maybe open software for example so if you have um, producing outputs that have data, then you maybe want to show the data openly. If you're processing these data, then you may have code that is related to that as well. Um, but then we also have uh, other things, for example, hardware. 
Um, anyone who actually works in research with hardware is probably familiar with the fact that it's horribly expensive, but it doesn't have to be that way. It's also possible that you might be able to have cheap, affordable, open designs that don't require an expensive technician to come along. Uh, and then we also talk about some of the project management skills that you may need to manage projects like this. Um, and just things like iterating over the work that you're doing and involving community members while you're on the way. And the very next week we've been, so after previously having talked about some of the uh, outputs that we create, things like the software and the open data and the open hardware and whatever else we may be creating, then we start talking about ways to disseminate this openly. Um, and within academia, researchers often use the paper. It's probably the most traditional output that's out there. But we also consider other outputs that may be available, for example, uh, whether there may be things that you can do like citizen science or whether your training might be an output, getting DOIs for the work that you're doing that's not a traditional paper-based work. Um, and so we actually end up bringing in lots of experts talking about different ways to disseminate the work that you're doing. Uh, the next week, we start talking again about the inclusive elements that we mentioned earlier. Um, so how to involve diverse perspectives and sign against information abuse and think, thinking about things like implicit bias, which is so, so hard to spot and it's something you end up feeling guilty and often really bad for when you do realize it happens. But it's important to build in and build controls for that so that you're not accidentally behaving in biased ways. And we talk about also personas and pathways for interaction. So this uh, reflects back on a couple of weeks ago. We also, we talked about contribution guidelines, for example. So personas and pathways are a way of stepping that up where you think about who's contributing or who you'd like to contribute and how you can build pathways for them to come in and to contribute and then to contribute further if they wish. We also uh, step back a bit and we say, okay, you've probably been working your butt off at this point, uh, worrying about your project and about how to bring others in and how to make them feel involved and how to make them valued and step back and actually do the same for yourself. So say, um, I need to look after myself and I need to take a break. I need to care for myself when I am running these projects. I also need to model this for others because um, it's hard for you to expect other people to be looking after themselves if you're not doing it for yourself. And we also talk about ally skills. Uh, so this being the skill of if you witness uh, something that's uh, a power imbalance or something that's inappropriate and you are in a scenario where you are capable of speaking up, learning about how to do that in a safe and correct and useful way. So looking after yourself and then eventually also looking after others as well and amongst the topics that we cover. Um, and we also talk about careers. So whilst academia would have you perhaps believe that the only way to succeed in academia is to follow the traditional pathways of being a PI or an, in academia, there are lots of different ways to be a researcher or to be a scientist. So we actually end up bringing in experts from different domains, whether that be um, entrepreneurs, policy makers, educators, there's lots of different ways that are absolutely valid research and scientific ways to, um, to take your career forwards. Um, and after that, we have spent a long time and we have learned a lot of stuff. So we actually start to step back and reflect on our successes. So the last two calls that you have in Open Life Science, if you're a participant, one reflects on your progress, uh, think about next steps and you start practicing. So you, you can do a presentation just amongst your peers. It's relatively private and then you can get further feedback on what you've been doing and where you're planning to go in the future. Um, but then the next step is that we actually do this publicly. Uh, so final presentations and graduations, every cohort participant gets about five minutes to share their work, share their learnings and share their plans with others. And for OLS1, we actually live streamed this. And it was probably one of our most special moments when um, we had someone who reported that her mother hadn't been able to make it to her wedding and hadn't been able to make it to her PhD defense, but she made it to her OLS1 graduation. I think that was just like one of the most special moments I had from the whole, co whole cohort. Um, but that's all online. So that's one thing I actually don't know if we mentioned earlier is that every single one of these calls that we've described is recorded um, and it's on the YouTube channel for Open Life Science. So they can be caught up as well, which is another actually important part of inclusivity is making sure that people can still participate and get an idea of what's been going on, even if you're not there. Um, so here are the first graduates from round one. 
and you can see some of the screenshots of people presenting their presentations. Um, and OLS2, we've actually recycled some of these people. So previously they were learners, they were um, developing their own projects. This time we've actually looped them in and they can now be mentors and experts because they, they now have more of the experience in leading open science. Um, and this is also a nice demonstration of the pathways that you can build in where um, they start with the earlier engagement as a participant in the cohort and then we build in anyone who is interested and able to step up and now start participating as a mentor or an expert can continue on that way. Um, no, don't edit it. Move on to the next slide, please. That's all I want. Oh, okay, there's no more slides. So that's, <laughs> that's why it's not going to the next slide. <laughs> Okay, I think that's just basically an overview of the types of things that we try and teach as part of open leadership. And so we try and keep it really broad. Um, and sometimes each talk is, you know, a quick five, 10 minutes. Uh, it's more like touching on this is a topic that you can now explore later if you wish for f in, in the future. Um, but I think that's everything for now. So I'll stop sharing and just check if there's any questions in the hack md oh well malvika have you been noting again thank you <laughs> no wasn't you amazing okay so whoever has been noting thank you so much um are there any questions at this point anything anyone would like to verbalize or ask about i had a quick question i don't know the the protocol for raising hands here that's a great protocol. That works just on <laughs> Okay. Um, uh, I was wondering how the mentors and mentees are paired up. Is it like a convenience thing? Do you look at backgrounds? Um, how does that work? Yes. <laughs> uh, so it, it tends to be a, 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 a slightly challenging process because we, we do try and take as much as we can in. Um, so we had applicants, for example, for OLS2 from six different continents. And that's a lot of time zones. Um, so we definitely take in whether or not they'll be awake at the same time, because that's really helpful. Uh, we try and take in subject knowledge. Um, so who, what mentors, what they already know versus what um, the mentees may wish to learn. Um, and sometimes uh, there may be scenarios where we think, well, this person really is good at, let's say, um, ecology, but they also want some expertise from uh, coding as well. So we might suggest that two people co-mentor or that they bring in experts to speak on the aspects that aren't covered by one mentor uh, because we acknowledge that it's not reasonable to ask everyone to know all the things. <laughs> Just to add to that, all these mentors actually register with a short bio and they describe what their expertise and interests are. So that really helps us. But at the end, we also allow uh, our mentors to look at other applications that we haven't assigned them and find out if they feel that there is a better application for them. Thanks, Malvika. I know um, Esther's also said thank you for the sharing the recordings and that you've been sharing them as well. I'm really delighted to hear that. So thank you so much, Esther. <laughs> um, okay. I think, unless, or if there's any more questions, again, it's okay to unmute or use the hand function in Zoom or also just to add them in the HackMD, whatever works for you. So I'll uh, wait a moment just in case there's any more questions. Go ahead. <laughs> the <laughs> projects that people bring to, to the Open Life Science are, is, what, what, is there any limit on what the project have to be? You have to be like any life science in general, or even you are going beyond to what's the, the ages of what life science is? I think, um, so this is actually quite a common question and we do, we're very happy to have this stretch. So I think we've had people who've done research data management and there's not necessarily been a lot of uh, life science in it. Uh, one of the applicants for OLS2, one of the participants in OLS2 rather, um, their, their uh, life science is all to do with dead things, <laughs> which almost feels anti-life science. Uh, no, not really. <laughs> um, but basically open science that has some tangential relation to, to life science tends to be absolutely fine. Uh, there are some limits like 
your project has to be safe. We're not going to support something that's actually we, we wouldn't consider safe for some reason. Um, and it has to have an open element. So if it looked like you were actually looking for angel investors, for example, that might not be an appropriate um, setting for open life science. But as long as you're embracing open and it is open science-y, then it's probably welcome. Okay, I'm going to suggest, um, so we have some breakouts where we start talking about what we practice. Uh, so in this case, uh, the idea is that to talk about uh, community practices, either that you already wish um, or, or that you already use in communities that you have, or if you feel like maybe you don't really use open community practices, then it's also okay to talk about ones that you would like to see or that you've seen in other projects that you really admire. Um, so what we would do, uh, I think maybe two, two, three breakout rooms um, where we have, let's say, two minutes for everyone to talk. David yeah, already this... made breakout rooms. Amazing. <laughs> yeah, so just let me know when you're ready and then I can okay. get people going. Right. Um, I'll just, so just recap the goal for the o breakout rooms is to talk about community practices that you use already or would like to use um, and just share any insights so i'd ask every every room to make at least one bullet point ideally one bullet point per person in the um it's about line 107 right now in the hack md and just write down some notes about what you chat about uh, different community practices that you see or like is that reasonably clear can i have thumbs up if yes okay we have thumbs up and we will send you into the rooms david when you're ready Thank you. Okay, so should we have a quick report out from each room, some bullet points, important insights? How about uh, Alex? Which room you were in? <laughs> oh, oh, what was, which was breakout room two? Breakout room Elizabeth. three. So you were with, you ended up being with David, Elizabeth, yes. Esther. And, and Esther. Yes. Oh, is it just the one you want us to pick? No, just go ahead and tell us something. So, uh, so we've talked, I think the first thing that was mentioned was Slack. And uh, personally, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I like Slack. Um, I don't know how others feel ab about it. It's probably not for everyone. Um, but yes, it, it's it's probably one of the one of the commonly used tools. We also mentioned community calls to to catch everyone up on the latest developments in the community. Uh, we mentioned taking notes, uh, and that's to help people who who are not there. So uh, again, to try and uh, catch them up on what's been going on. We mentioned um, designating meeting roles. So having a facilitator, timekeeper, gatekeeper, and so on. So, so that's very important. Otherwise, we can just get lost in, um, in a meeting. Emails as well. Again, important to, to uh, use in, um, in uh, conjunction with Slack because not everyone uses um, Slack and uh, email is also useful for people to asynchronously um, catch up on what's been going on. And then um, I added something just after we got out. Face, well, actually, I mentioned this face-to-face -face events, but I, then I expanded a bit um, different types of face-to-face -face events. Uh, things like conferences, networking and community building events, uh, workshops and other co-creation events. Um, again, some retreats maybe to strengthen the community and so on. So this is what we managed to, to do. We actually spent more time introducing and chatting. <laughs> that was actually the biggest intention of Regard, but you already got a lot out of it. So the other room had Mike, Peter, and Anna Jayat. Can uh, Is there something that you want to add to what Alex already said? I was going to give Peter and Nazia a, a chance to unmute, but I, I guess I'll go ahead. And, um, we, we also um, spent most of our time just uh, introducing ourselves. Um, and we were talking about how um, we're all three of us were coming onto this call to learn more about open communities because 
Carpentries are, are basically, or Carpentries is the um, um, community that we're, um, that we know about as being like an open community that works like this. So um, it's interesting to see how others um, are doing the same sort of things and how we can be involved. Amazing. Um, so before we go to the next section, is there any question you have that came out of your discussion prompted by anything you and I talked about before you went into the breakout? Yes, Mike. Yeah. I, I actually just had a, a follow-up question to, I, I think Alex said it um, about the um, meeting roles. Uh, not to sidetrack too much, but I was just wondering a, a quick uh, definition of like the, what a facilitator and a gatekeeper do. Uh, Alex, do you wanna explain that? I could explain. Um, I think it was Elizabeth who added this, wasn't okay. it? But yeah. I could, yeah, Elizabeth, do you want to say something? I can I can try and have a go at it as well. Sure. Um, I there's actually an anecdote behind this. As sharing this, I have a friend who's a researcher um, at in North Carolina, at University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, and she is starting a graduate student like open education uh, kind of council or group. And she called the other day and she was so frustrated because things have been going really well. And then someone they want to be open, someone stopped by the meeting and basically dominated the whole meeting, talking about things that they hadn't planned to talk about, but they had already resolved. And um, and so I told her about our meeting roles, um, not just the gatekeeper, but the facilitator and note taker and how we rotate them usually in the carpentry. So um, the facilitator isn't the person who's like in charge necessarily. It's the person who's in charge of making sure that the meeting uh, runs smoothly and that everyone gets to be involved and in keeping track of hands and things. Um, and then the gatekeeper is a person who during the meeting focuses on figuring out if one person or maybe even several people are dominating the conversation and stepping in to create space for the other people who may not be speaking to be able to speak. Um, there's lots of different ways to do this. I think the simplest is um, just to ask that person to remind people that other people haven't spoken. Um, and then the timekeeper uh, keeps track of the time. So the person who says we had you know, 10 minutes scheduled for this uh, topic, we're now at 10 minutes, um, so we need to move on. Um, over 10 minutes to the hour and we try and give a five minute break between meetings that we need to wrap up. And those are the three that I mentioned because I think they're the most important as well as the note taker. Yeah, and Alex. Just wanted to add one person can take more of these roles. So you don't have a, a, a don't need to have a designated person for each of these roles. So it can be one person can be a timekeeper and a facilitator. Um, but note keeper, I would also give a big plus one for that. Um, so I was I was involved in in organizing Carpentry Con, the face-to-face -face conference, which did not happen. And at the point where we introduced a note taker, that was so helpful, such a change, because we would we would come and we would discuss things, and then no one would take notes officially. And then when we introduced an official note taker, that was just such such huge help because then we had rec record of all the meetings consistently. I just also wanted to throw in a comment actually about uh, Elizabeth, Elizabeth, you mentioned sometimes people will just dominate the room. Um, and whilst it, this doesn't always work if people um, don't really care, if people do care, sometimes a reminder that if you are one of N people in the room, taking up N, one nth of the amount of time can be a really useful reminder. So the end of my story is that my friend called after their next meeting and said, oh my goodness, this was like magic. The same person attended and they designated a gatekeeper and the gatekeeper didn't have to do anything um, because they introduced the role at the beginning of the meeting and then asked everyone, do you all agree to this? We would like everyone to have an equal platform and the people who had dominated the conversation before took a step back it was like 
they, they, I don't know. I don't want to say that they even identified themselves as being the people who had dominated. It just set this tone for the meeting that they complied with. So she was so happy. <laughs> yeah, that really does uh, changes everything. And I, I think one of the good things that I learned participating in Carpentries Community Call is that people are asked to volunteer. So that's like, you know, you can self, if you are the speaker and if you don't want to talk too much, assign yourself as note taker, you would not talk too much. <laughs> Okay, so with that, I'll move on. We have some really good topics to cover and the next one is probably one of the most interesting one because that connects to the discussions we just had. So you. Okay, share screen and I'll click on the correct window when I can find it. Okay, um, I'll share the whole window then. Right, let me make that a bit bigger. There we go. Right, okay, so now we're talking about the difference between open by default and open by design. Um, so here, going back to our trusty open leadership framework uh, sentence here, open leaders design and build projects uh, to empower uh, others to, to collaborate with inclusive communities. Apologies, I'm getting tongue-tied here. But this time we're focusing on the design aspect of things. Um, and we'll go in a little bit into why we actually uh, focus so much on the design of this. Um, so this, yeah, let, let's unpack the difference between open by default and open by design. Uh, so here are some questions. Uh, maybe feel free to even write some notes in the HackMD about why you think this may or may not be open. So here's a scenario. Taro, he loves to write Python scripts and he works as a bioinformatician. Uh, so he's working with virus data and he's helping a lot of people in his research group with similar problems that they may have to do with um, different virus related uh, research outputs. And so their supervisor says to them, hey, why don't you put this online? You know, this is pretty good work. You've been writing some scripts for your data. And so they upload it publicly and then they send an email and everyone says, hey, now rather than coming to me to ask for help, you can actually go online and you can, um, you, you, you can use this from this online repository that I've created. Uh, so yeah, have a think whether you think that is open um, and if why it is open or why it's not open. I'll actually pause for just a moment so people can note this in the HackMD. Um, so just maybe in the shared notes if anyone wants to put any thoughts about why it, why it might, may or may not be open. Or if anyone wants to unmute. Okay, uh, so we have one question about the license um, and another saying that it's open in terms of the end result being openly accessible, uh, but the way it's constructed is more closed. Um, I'll let the person who's typing uh, type and I won't read it out because I get really nervous when people are writing what I'm typing. Um, so yeah, I think that sort of sums up a couple of the points. So um, when you think about openness, um, if you sort of, put things online, then it can sometimes, that, that is a definition of openness. So you are sharing stuff, but this would be where I would go for it's being open by default rather than open by design. Um, and equally licensing is an important way of allowing you to say whether or not it's legal to reuse. Uh, okay, this is really annoying. The, the pop-up is coming, so I can't switch my tab that I wanna switch because the pop-up covers a tab every time I go there. I don't know if you can see that. Um, Nope. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I'll try closing another tab. And there we go. Right. Okay. I've engineered getting to the correct tab. Apologies. Right. Um, so yeah, what we were saying earlier, it is open by default. So can people reuse the scripts? Possibly. Can they improve them? Um, unless you've built a way to make that, possibly not. It sort of depends what you've done when you designed the repository. Um, there's no information about how to cite it, so you might want to credit Taro for his work, but if you haven't added that information, then it may not have the information they need. Uh, depending on where the site has been set, it may not be that they can share it, so it could be on the server, um, you know, internally, so that still many people can reuse it, but, you know, not outside the lab. 
Um, and there's no guidance for how to manage different interactions. So for example, um, you know, if people are saying, oh, this code is crap, there's not much to do about it, for example. Um, so this talk sort of talks about the open by default. So yeah, it is open. But if you design the openness that you're doing, then there are ways to actually make the community interactions better and to make the reusability better. And people can also feed back, which is perhaps the single most important thing that if other people can tell you how to make it better, then you can improve it. And if you don't build the pathways to do so, then it's very hard. Um, so to sum that back up, the question is not, will we open it? But how will we open this? What is our strategy behind what we're doing? And so open by design, it means that you are considering what you're doing in a systematic way and also in a safe way. So just like we, we talk about sharing things so that people can reuse them effectively, you also need to think, actually, should I be sharing this? Because there's plenty of scenarios where things have been breached either uh, maliciously or by lack of thought. And there are all sorts of things that we shouldn't be sharing. So think about that and make sure that you're sharing appropriately and not radically. Um, and it's more than just factoring and privacy, but thinking about it being open throughout its life cycle and even before it's created, because sometimes you can't go back and you cannot amend the decisions you've made early on. And David, it's been lovely to have you here and we're sorry you have to head off. <laughs> um, yeah, so think, think carefully um, about when you're sharing, how you're gonna do it and how you can best facilitate interactions with others. Uh, so open by design scenarios, Taro, he might now to improve his repository, he'll add, add an open license. Uh, so that might be CC BY or for software, it might be a software license. He will add a readme that just gives some information about the script that they've written. Uh, add contribution guidelines, that means that other people can now have a pathway to help, to participate, to improve, to comment. They can get a DOI for their repository, that way other people can cite them if they write a publication. And add the contact information. It's a little thing, but it's so helpful if you actually think, well, how can people tell me how to fix this or ask a question? And add a code of conduct to your repository just to set, consciously say, these are the types of interactions I want to see, because if you don't consciously set that, other norms may arise that aren't the ones that you wanted. So try and set, set up the ones that you'd rather see. And a to sum up, open by design shouldn't be a thoughtless default. It should be something that you, you think about very caref carefully and very consciously. And that is everything from me on this. So I'll hop back over to the HackMD. Um, does anyone have any questions at this point? Uh, actually, what I'll ask, again, if you look at the next, se next section, questions to reflect on. And so based on the differences you've learned, how do you categorize your community interaction practices? Are there scenarios where perhaps it's open by default or places that you could improve? Or maybe you're just really proud and you think, hey, my community is awesome. That's also great. But, you know, share some of those good open things that you like. <laughs> OK, I think typing is slowing down just a little bit. Uh, so feel free to keep typing if you have other things you want to say. Uh, is there anyone who would like to unmute and perhaps share one of the things they thought about or added here? I'll run through a few. Uh, so I just commented that I think sometimes even really mature projects don't consciously think about ways to be open. Um, and the culture change there can be really hard, which actually perhaps is one reason to think about the open by design from early on, because it's a lot harder to change a culture that's embedded than it is to set up a new culture. Um, someone says they've seen a combination of both. Uh, people who've newly come across openness that uh, weren't exposed to it are being intentional by design. And like, I know my first couple of repos when I started writing code and putting it online and maybe even had a license, but I had no idea what I was doing. I still think no one's ever looked at them. Um, and that, that may be part of the difference between the conscious design and knowing what to do <laughs> as opposed to um, just the defaults. Um, and for some open by design requires additional work and resources. I, I definitely think that it's true. Sometimes it does take more work, but it can also have so many advantages as well, like bringing in other contributors and other viewpoints. Uh, notes about repository. I have a license in code conduct. I should think carefully about how to ensure the reporting pathway is clearly stated. That's one I cannot emphasize enough because um, otherwise it looks like the code of conduct can just be for show rather than actually something that you really want to implement. Um, so that's a really important one. A lot of people saying that m many communities are open by default, but the Turing Way and CSCCC are open, are open by design. 
and a lot more open to contributions. So nice case studies there. <laughs> um, Slack's open to join but needs registration to make sure we don't let spam bots or other enter without our knowledge. That's a good point. Sometimes you have to design against abuse as well, uh, which isn't fair. And sometimes that's why we can't have nice things, uh, but it is an important thing to design. Um, institutionally, it's been hard to even get to open it all. Ouch, I feel you. Um, I, I remember one of my favorite tips that you're not supposed to say is when you're writing your grant, say, and this will be on GitHub and it will be open. And then if your university or your research organization wants to argue, they can't because it's already in the funding conditions. Um, but that's really sneaky. <laughs> I'm not against being sneaky when necessary. Um, the Carpentries is setting definitely open by design, which is not to say the community is constantly looking at how to improve. Um, yeah. That's right, that just because something's open by design now doesn't mean you don't want to continue to design further. Um, you know, things are not static. Communities are definitely not static. An old repo doesn't have much of this info, but does have documentation and conferences are open to attend, but expensive, so not really accessible. Another really good point. A lot of times if money is a barrier, you might want to consider who you are excluding and whether you can offer things like fellowships or fee waivers to help things out. Um, any more questions after this? Uh, if I may ask a question, uh, sure. this is Anazia. Uh, so, say once a communication uh, spins off, uh, say uh, some researchers communicated and they have made it open by design, so some discussion takes place. So, are there really good examples of derivative works uh, and those results being shared back with the um, original researcher or the community who shared those things initially. So how do we connect these communities? So in case of software, it becomes maybe fork and it goes contributes like back to the base project in Git. But in terms of projects, uh, how do we go about it? That is a great question. Um, and you had the first answer that I was going to throw in, which was software is probably the easiest example of um, like when people make a pull request to contribute a fix. I'm going to open it to the floor if anyone has any interesting examples of non-software outputs that have had uh, further feedback. So I think a lot of the Carpentries training are built that way. Um, not just training, but the design infrastructure that has been reused by non-Carpentries material. So I think that's really an excellent example for documentation and training materials. Incredibly on topic as well. <laughs> um, any more questions? So again, feel free to throw them into the HackMD line 164, I think. Um, and we will come back to those if we miss them. Okay, I think we'll move on to the persona and pathways exercise. Um, we may not have time for the second breakout after at the end, but I think we knew that would be the case. Um, Malvika, are you good for the personas and pathways? I'll give a quick overview so I can still save you about 10 minutes for the second breakout. Um, so in this part, we will actually focus on collaboration. We've looked at uh, design. Now let's look at collaboration. So same old uh, open leaders design and build project that empowers others to collaborate within inclusive communities. So the question that we're gonna ask about is what can I do for people? It's not just about what other people can do for my project. How can I involve them and empower them? What can we build together that we cannot do apart? For example, there are a lot of things that I might have as skill, but there are a lot of things I can do together with all of you instead of doing it away from you. So I think I need to think about how to make best use of your skills combined with mine. So in this session, in this next 10 minutes, what we'll do is think about what will your project do for others, understand how to design project to increase participation and share how to create solution to uh, re participation barriers. So the tool is called Persona. Persona is a description of an imaginary person based on real world observation and understanding of actual potential or current users. 
So in short, who are the people you most need in your community? Who is there and who is missing? In our case, uh, because we talk a lot about computational places, we need to build a technological solution, but we need to also remember that the people who are building these are more important than the technology itself. So what's in a persona? We think about what could be their, you know, possible name, age, convincing, identifying details, what kinds of skills they have, the level of knowledge they bring, what kind of needs they might have, and what kind of barriers that may keep them away from my project. And we can use these persona creation tool to create multiple examples, not just one. A persona creation tool helps team to develop a common understanding of who their users and community members are and create an empathetic pathway for them to engage with the project. So earlier in the talks, you've seen a Sam, you've seen a Joy, and you've seen a Taro. The reason we give names, because you can actually learn a lot uh, from how we describe them, instead of not describing them by their possible identity. So there, there are several persona canvas. This is something that I liked because it's CC by that you can use, and that actually would lead you to understand how to think about uh, a persona. Um, I've also written a persona creation chapter in the project that I work in. So if you want to have a look at that, I have sneakily put a self-promotional link there. For the session purpose, I have created two persona. We have, a, we have Taro, who's making a comeback, and we have Kala. So let's see who Kala is. Kala is a trans woman. Uh, Kala is an IT student, activist, artist, motivated by artificial intelligence, design, and animation. And her barrier is include barrier is funding. Uh, Kala in general is driven by artificial intelligence, design, and animation, as uh, said earlier. Nataro is non-conforming. is a software developer. Uh, they are humanitarian. They love saving animals. Have nine rescue cats. Their barrier is time constraint because of all these important work they are doing. So they they love animals. They get involved in humanitarian work. Based on all these information, we need to think about how can we engage Kala and Taro in my open project? What can I offer them? What can they bring to my project? How can they engage? And what would they gain? So I think as project developer, we spend a lot of time obsessing about how can I build my project? What will my project bring to the world? But we also need to think about who are involved in the process. How can they have a mutually rewarding experience in the world? So that was really short description. When you actually build persona, you have to fill up more and more information. So I filled more information for Kala. Kala is an undergraduate in her first year of IT. She's pretty hip, lives in a city called Bangalore in India. She does not know many people, but is very outgoing and would like to make friends. Kala has heard about hackathon and working open, but she doesn't really have an idea how that can be useful for AI research. So Kala's research is not very popular and she often looks for sources and credible evidences and she also suffers from self-esteem. Knowing all these details, I need to now use Kala's skills of AI, Kala's desire to find more credible evidences and to make sure that Kala feels safe in my community. Kala and Taro could be me and you who will join your project or you will join my project. And from that perspective, we need to think about who our user and contributors are. Now, persona is not enough. You need to combine it with pathway. Pathway is the journey that these users and participants like Kala and Taro would take to engage with our project and uh, come in contact and potentially have a sustained relationship with our project. So to some summarize it, we need to remove barrier. We need to identify what these barriers could be. We need to create a clear pathway for them by iterating, by stating clearly uh, what these pathway would look like for them. And the pathway creation can have further more understanding of how would they discover my uh, community? What would be the way they will come in contact with us? What, how they can participate? What is their sustained participation? What, how would they have network participation? And finally, can I give them enough opportunity to take leadership roles? Now let's go back to Kala and think about how Kala would find open life science. So discovery is that Kala saw a retweet from her colleague about open life science. 
her first contact was that Kala joined a webinar or a session like this, and she enjoyed the call, she got to know us. Kala's participation could be that she applied for the third round because OLS2 attendees recommended her. Then her sustained participation would be that she created her first repository uh, in OLS3 and con continues to apply her learn skill in developing the project. The network participation could be that she hosted a networking event in her university and invited other colleagues to join her effort. And finally, her leadership will look like not just by the project that she launches and leads, but also returns to the fourth cohort as a mentor. So this is a very small part of the OLS that we can think about for a person who could be Kala or who could be you. Finally, we need to also think about mentored contribution. It's not just enough to say, hey, this is the project and that you need to do it. We have the task list. We need to also be mentoring these people. For example, making sure there is a contribution guideline. We have uh, enough way and resources for people to understand how to get in touch with us and how can they stay involved. And then also comes the ongoing support. It's not just about bringing them in and forgetting about them, but also being there for them when they need help with some question or they would need any feedback um, and how else we can also make them feel part of the community. And that is by organizing community events or uh, community calls that we've already discussed. So there are different ways of designing that you can think about. You can design your communication strategies, you can design your events, you can design your facilitation techniques. Very thankfully, we've talked about this earlier. And we also need to think about how we can help others advance the skill and not just come in with certain skill and help our project. So with that, I'll end our persona and pathway. And as promised, we have some time for the second breakout. So. I think we can reuse the same breakout room or we can do also shuffle, um, David, whatever is easy. And let's do a 12 minutes breakout. Okay. Sign in rooms now. I need to explain what to do in the breakout. Sorry about that. So your breakout next would be about value exchange. It's not just so about... Let me wait for them to come back because I... Sorry about that. No, that was totally my mistake. Mm -hmm. Sorry to bring you all back. I thought I should have tell you what, uh, what to expect in the second breakout. So this breakout room would be about value exchange. So I, in the talk, said that you have to think about what you can gain, but what others can gain. So you have to uh, take that perspective in mind. And the question you're going to talk about is what kind of things do you give to others in your daily practices? What kind of things do you get back? Does the balance seem right for you? Are there adjustments you'd like to make? And to start with, uh, kindness is one of the things you might be giving back. Kindness is one of the things you get back. And does that seem right to you? So there are a lot of options to talk about so uh, now we can open the break breakout rooms welcome back everyone i will we were reading all the nice notes that were appearing on hackmz um i would just quickly read some of them because it looks like a lot of you have written uh, similar stuff for the things that you give to the community and what you get back, for example, recognition, which is very important, especially if, when you're working in volunteer based roles. That's the only thing you get back often. So that's very, very useful. Knowledge and information uh, experience. Then we also have honest feedback, encouragement, access to network. What kind of things you give back different point view uh, which is again diverse perspectives are very important as single person we can have only very limited understanding of certain topics then we also um, get back mentorship accountability constructive feedback um, challenging thoughts which is good for personal growth in-kind benefits which is always nice uh, especially when we start to travel around, it might be more useful. Tip about how 
many new and great tools uh, we can use. This is, yeah, this is really, really great. Like often we do icebreaker and in the icebreaker, we ask these kind of questions. It's always, always useful to hear what other people are using and if I can explore those. Does the, does the balance seem right to you? Um, I see Alex uh, has written something. Alex, you wanna unmute and share with us? Well, as, as we were trying to attack the first two questions, I just realized that I started copying and pasting things back and forth, uh, which then made me think that, that I'm involved in, in some great communities where, where the balance of, of giving and receiving in, is, is just right. So it's great. At yeah, least for I me. That's that's really great. Also, I feel like sometimes when you feel in not in your community, but if in cer certain space that you feel that it's not fair, uh, if that community allows you to speak your mind and raise the concern, I think that's also really good because I believe that a lot of people aren't excluding by intention, but they need to be made aware that this is happening and if this can be changed. Yeah, with some people it feels right, with some people it may seem unfair. Uh, that's why we always tell people the pay it forward rule that, you know, if you get something, give back to someone else, it doesn't have to come back from the same people. We would have like lots of ideas that, that we haven't discussed today. Um, and because we have one minute, I just wanna quickly thank you all for coming here uh, and attending this, we, we try to, squeezing a lot of things from different talks and cohort calls that we have, but we have loads of these resources available on our website. If you wanna go and explore, these are freely available. Uh, some of the things I quickly wanna remind you again, that please take a note on self-care and mental health. It's very important, mostly because uh, we know that we all have good desire to do good for the community, but you also need to make sure that you're allowed to say no, allowed to step back, there have been few sessions on these in Carpentry Con at home. So please have a look at, uh, at the session on burnout and how to protect yourself from that. Um, you've learned quite a lot from us and you've brought some great, great notes and great ideas to this uh, session. So we're very, very thankful to have this delightful time with you. Thank you, David, for hosting us. Uh, really, really great to have you help us on this. And uh, yeah, round of applause for all of you for making the session delightful. <laughs> so with that, we are ending. Uh, we can stop recording, but you and I decided to hang out for another 10 minutes if you wanna stick around and chat with us. <laughs>